Welcome to the Futurati podcast, where we showcase the pioneers and visionaries who are shaping the future. In this episode, we are thrilled to feature Noel Carroll, the CEO of BioFriendly, a world leader in green fuel solutions. Carroll is a driving force in modernizing BioFriendly and leading the company towards a leadership role in the environmental space. BioFriendly's breakthrough technology, Green Plus, is eco-labeled by the United Nations for reducing harmful greenhouse gas emissions, and the company is committed to being an innovator in this space. Join us as we explore the future of green technology with Noel Carroll and discover how BioFriendly is leading the charge toward a more sustainable future. Noel, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, the biofriendly company that you started and kind of some of your thinking that went into getting it off the ground. Okay. Well, so biofriendly actually, I, I guess I kind of was responsible for sort of recreating it, but actually biofriendly started well before me. Uh, biofriendly started about 20, almost 25 years ago. Uh, was a was a passion project actually of my my dad, uh, his brothers, and actually my older brother. Uh, I'm, I I got into the the environmental game here with them late back in, in 2018. So I was actually in entertainment mostly. And then when my when my dad and his brothers decided it was time to retire, my my brother, who's you know they're all very uh, you know they're they're engineers, you know scientists. They're 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 very much in that kind of spectrum of things, which is how they got into this kind of environmental space and, and technology in the first place is that's what they do. I have always been the weirdo in the, in my family where I'm, I'm into arts, uh, and, and, you know, got into the entertainment industry. We're out, out here in LA. Uh, and you know, about five years ago, uh, when they retired, my brother, he, he asked if I could jump over and kind of help out with, I guess, the, the organization kind of part of the company and, and uh, reframing it for the future. So I got into this basically because I was recruited by my brother to do so. And, uh, and I've been, been at it for about five years. Uh, and, and yeah, with, with Green Plus and BioFriendly, we do environmental technology and now education. So do you, do you blend the entertainment world with what you're doing? We do now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. So, so uh, yeah, like I said, I guess I'll, I'll give a little, little background. Um, some friends and I back in, in 2000 and, you know, 12, 2011, around there, uh, we, we started a, a web show. It was kind of a laugh. Uh, the idea was to have these, it was a show, a show called Good Cops. And the idea was that you'd have these three idiot cops who use faulty logic and explosions to solve crimes that nobody cares about. Uh, and then you find out at the end that the logic was perfect, the explosions were necessary, and that the crime was actually the crime of the century and that they solve it. And then everybody wins and has a laugh. And that went, that went really well. I, it, it took off because uh, I had been on a promotion kind of on the, on the internet back then. I, I still do from time to time. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, we promoted the series and, uh, and pushed it along and it got picked up by a company called Machinima, which was Warner brothers, uh, digital gaming arm at the time. And then they funded more of that show and then did, funded another show that was a companion piece to a video game called Red Dead Redemption. Uh, and then that was really, that was a show called Tumbleweed. That was also a success. And then we made a movie after that called, uh, I had a bloody good time at house Harker with shoreline entertainment, which also was a, was a, was a big kind of cult hit cold classic hit and uh and that was actually after we were finished with that was when when my my brother was like hey you're you're doing a good job organizing this producing the stuff we need help i'm gonna be alone here and and uh you know i, I ended up uh jumping on that but uh I, I keep the creative part going we actually there's kind of a problem and, and you know the audience to give them kind of background on the on the company the, the problem we have is that our their flagship product that they developed is something called green plus and Green Plus is essentially, it's a fuel additive, okay? So you add it to any, you know, diesel, gasoline, whatever, any any kind of, uh, of uh, fossil fuel, and it reduces the carbon impact of it by about 7%, and then the particulate matter by 30%. It has a UN echo label for it. Uh, it's approved by the US EPA and the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality as an uh, alternative formulation to reduce NOx, which, you know, which is okay. the, what creates smog. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, amazing revolutionary product. And that sort of has been the basis of the company, but kind of the realization of my brother was, was that, uh, look, if we, if we're going to continue, this probably won't last very long because the world is transitioning from 
fuels into, you know, electric, basically electric and renewables. And so how can we survive as, a, as an environmental company while having this additive, which, you know, there's, look, there's still, still going to be fuel burned for quite a long time, still be customers, but it's going to become less and less and less. So how do we transition that? So the first thing that we did when I jumped on is we started a, an educational initiative called Biofriendly Planet. And so Biofriendly Planet was a, basically it's the idea is to have fun and a laugh with the environment. And so we made a show called the Biofriendly Podcast where instead of browbeating people with why you're going to die tomorrow because the world's going to explode in a hellfire, but let's let's see if we can get people to come along with maybe a, a lighter, right? Let's see if we can get people to tell uh, uh, That seems like a brilliant way to approach it. I, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was interesting because it, it took a lot of research at first, right? So it was like, what can what can I do to kind of keep keep this sort of artistic environmental bent going, but also still help shift the company a little bit and then continue growing the company because I didn't want to really want to lose my life. You probably had more than a few people say you need to be more serious, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, still to this day and, and, and always probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So so then the, the products, uh, the Green Plus that you sell is actually sold yeah. in gas stations and truck, sta truck stops. Uh, is that correct? And then... People buy a yeah, bottle, that, put it in their car, um, and then I'm assuming that. So we actually do do. We actually don't do the bottles anymore. Okay, no bottles. Yeah, we, we don't do the bottles anymore. We we, we work directly with oil companies. Uh, usually, where there's a regulation problem, but the, the biggest example is in Texas. We're in the the product is in about seventy percent of the diesel in Texas. If you live in Texas and you have a diesel truck, you probably have the product in there automatically because there's a there's a regulation there to to basically make the fuel as clean as it is in California, except in California, they spend, we spend uh, about 35 cents a gallon refining it. It's pretty expensive. And, and in Texas, they get the same results, except they use an additive and it, it costs them, you know, a fraction of that. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the biggest example. And then that's also in a ton of fuel in Latin America. And then we also work with, with city, civic governments and things like that. So it's pretty much, it's in a pump somewhere or it's, it's, you know, or it's splash blended for, like fleets okay. directly. Yeah. Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. So so yeah. most people don't even know that they're buying this, but it's part of the product. Is that right? Exactly. Option? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so thinking thinking forward. Um, what, what percentage of the cars on the road today will still be, uh, gas powered cars in 2030 and then 2040? I think there will still be a lot in, in uh, 2030 because, so California generally leads the way when it comes to, to anything that would be considered like an environmental or eco-friendly or whatever that is. That's there. That's, that's sort of something that California hangs their hat on is that we're going to be the first to do that thing, no matter what it is. Right. Uh, and so California has set the, their regulation that, that all the cars, gasoline powered cars need to be electric by 2030. Uh, and so that would be new cars, not the old cars. People usually don't get rid of the old cars right away. So you got to figure that if they start all being that way by 2030, you, you know, you've still probably got at least five years till the new ones are, are being replaced by electric ones for, for most people. And then, you know, by the time they all get off the road, I, I think that I think that I think that slowly but surely the other states will probably follow suit, and I think it's actually less because of the environmental impact of electric vehicles, because there's actually some some negative ones. Believe it or not, people don't don't think there are, but there there actually are. Um, right. But because of the you know, the you know, it's, I, I don't think it's environmental reasons. I think it's because electric cars have been made pretty cool. I think it's because they're fast. You know, they're they're fast and they they have huge computer screens on them, and they you know they're they're fun and and they. The more infrastructure that's put in to make them easy to fill up, which right now is, I think, their biggest problem, 
the more people will adopt them just because they feel like they're cool cars. And and I think that's probably more the reason than environmentalism as much as as a, an environmentalist who probably would help the people were, were <laughs> going that way. I, I don't know why I, I, I yeah. think they're doing it because they think. Well, it seems yeah. that most people are um, have range anxiety that it's not going to go as far as I want it to. And then it takes too long to recharge it. And mm -hmm. And then if it's cold outside, I have to run the heater and that's going to give me less distance in my car. And so those are some of the common complaints. Um, you you probably hear a lot more on your end. Yeah, well, so we, we uh, because of the you know, Biofriendly Planet, you know, which is our, our education kind of initiative, we've had to do a lot of deep dives into, into all this stuff. And so, yeah, we do hear those complaints. I think for the most part, you know, the, the Tesla is still kind of the, the, the king of it the hill uh, and that's just because they've been out of the longest and they've probably got the longest lasting battery they do have have that at least for the, the mass production car um and they're they're kind of the, ahead of the game for most of the problems they have the most charging stations they even sort of set themselves up so it's like what are you going to do around town how are you going to use it around town and so that's that's how that works but yeah people don't want to use them in long range because you know if, if there's a if there's an accident on the freeway between here and vegas as an example there's only a couple places you can charge and it takes a while, right? So you could be yeah. completely hooked and people don't want that, right? So, so you get right. a, a lot of nervousness for trips like that. Yeah, um, I, was, I was born and, uh, in, born and raised in South Dakota. So that's okay. uh, about as remote as you can get up there. So, uh, sure. So, as, yeah, and I think, yeah. So I go ahead. As the CEO of the company, then, do you have, an electric car or a gas-powered car? Uh, I've actually got a good old-fashioned diesel diesel truck. Oh, okay. <laughs> surprise a lot of people, but I do. Yeah. Um, so, so the thing about a about a good old-fashioned diesel truck, and it's it's a it's a two thousand two thousand six Ford F two fifty, and so one of the things that's underrated about about vehicles, and this is the actual biggest issue with electric cars that doesn't really get a lot of attention is you actually want the thing that you're driving to last as long as possible because the amount of carbon emissions in just creating, building these things, both gasoline powered cars, diesel powered cars, and also electric ones, it's, it's their emissions intense. They, they, uh, they, they hurt the environment to make, right? And they also create a lot of waste to get rid of them. So I, you know, my, my, I guess my excuse for being in the, in the, the big loud, you know, burly diesel is it's more, it's more fuel efficient than the gasoline versions. And, uh, and it will still last another hundred thousand miles or more, uh, if I want it to, right. Uh, which is a different way of looking at environmental environmentalism, but that's a really important part of it is how long can you make something last? How long can you reuse things? How long can you keep the things that you have going? Because waste right. is a really big issue that, and with electric vehicles, the, the battery is complicated to build and it's not really efficient enough to be what we're, I think it will be, I think it's going to get there. And I think that, that the more money and effort and energy that goes into the batteries, the better it will get. But at the moment, the battery is, you know, it's a, it's a gigantic phone battery, essentially. It's a I mean, it's different. It's not exactly the same, but it's, that's basically what it is. And they're not great once they're done. Right, they're, they're, you're seeing, you, we don't have a lot of great recycling options yet. We don't have a lot of great disposal options yet. And to make it, you have to get lithium pretty much from South America. You have to get nickel from Australia, and you have to then get some uh, cobalt from from uh, Africa. And then you put them together and take them to China. And then when they're in China, you smelt it all. And you put together the battery, and then you ship that back to America. The cost of all that emissions-wise is catastrophic. So if you have an electric car make it last because you need to have your electric car last about six years to outweigh the emission of a gasoline powered or a powered car and about eight or nine years to outweigh the, the emissions of a diesel powered car. So hold on to it and, and you'll be good, but just make it last. Don't, don't treat it like you do with cars where you just turn it over and get rid of the next one. So, um, so where, where do you go from here? Because you're, um, the, you're obviously going to run out of market sometime in the future for the Green Plus. Anyway, uh, do you have other products that are in the pipeline? 
Yeah, do we you... do, and that's what, that's where my my brother gets to have fun now because because I worry about selling this one and, and uh, building up the the biofriendly planet network. W- one thing is biofriendly planet is is one of the things that we'll be continuing to move forward and, and pushing along. Okay, uh, our podcast the biofriendly podcast is is uh, is fast growing in popularity. Um, our our website biofriendlyplanet.com is is we're doing another big old revamp and overhaul of it because it's getting too many views it's getting so many views that are currently the way we haven't set it up it's it's, uh, it's actually crashing <laughs> so we're having to, to deal with that um, yeah. but the concept of giving people environmental tips and tricks and ideas without beating them up about it without telling them they're doing everything wrong has been very successful and, and uh, we think we'll be more so as we continue to add more content and more more fun to it so that's 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 one place uh, but we also we're also looking at the other problems. There's a lot of problems out there to be dealt with, and that's where we're focusing our our tech budget, basically. But okay. um, without getting too much into what we're doing, because I can't release all of it yet. Uh, but basically, we're looking at the problems that problems like microplastics uh, are a big deal. Uh, energy energy is everything, right? So how can you extend the life of solar panels? That's one thing we're we're working on. Uh, how do you make more use out of hydro? Uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, these are the kind of areas that we're looking into and that's where we're de- investing and also reducing aviation impact because that's a big problem for the future as well, is that yeah. aviation emissions are, are kind of devastating because of where they're placed in the atmosphere and what they do to, to ozone and, uh, and what yeah, contrails do for. Yeah. I've always, I've always thought that, um, uh, both the aviation and the cargo ships were the biggest polluters on the planet or. Two, two of the biggest polluters, anyway. Um, yeah. So, so, do your products work on ships and in planes? Yeah. So, in ships, uh, we're, we're already already approved, and, and now we're we're jumping into that market. So that's that's one we're looking at, which will have a long run because there's there's going to be a well, so they can make an efficient ship that's that's not powered with fuel oil. It's just kind of is what it is. Um, and then with the the planes, there's actually a, there's a very long and involved process uh, and an expensive process, but we are. Yeah, we are, we're uh, we've started that. We've begun that process, and, and uh, we're working on getting approved. Uh, so it'll, it'll take another, like, probably another year, honestly, before just getting it approved is done. Because you don't want to just throw something in an airplane and then put it up in the sky without having it properly, completely so, safety tested. So that's getting yeah. approvals through the FAA or some other agencies. Is that correct? Exactly. Now you either have to be approved through the FAA or through the the Department of of, uh, of Defense. <laughs> Those are the only places we can get get approval. Okay. Yeah. All right. And how well accepted are your products in other countries? Uh, very well. So in developing countries, it's it's really highly accepted because that's where they have a much tougher road to transition. And so we work actually with the United Nations uh, very closely uh, to basically provide options for them to meet the for like these to excuse me these developing countries to meet their sustainable development goals, uh, which is a a bigger deal for them than it is here. I think in the, in the in the, in the Western world, we, we kind of look at sustainable development goals as like a nice thing that we make the you know make the rest of the world do. <laughs> but for them, it's, it's kind of how they measure you know whether whether or not they're they're transitioning in in a good way or not. So um, we work very closely with the UN to to be part of those sustainable development goals. We're actually echo labeled uh, for that purpose. So a lot of these you know uh, country governments, civic governments, fleets, oil companies, they can they can use the product to to help meet those goals. And so. We do quite well, particularly in Latin America. There's there's a lot of a lot of oil companies and the yeah, yeah. government's using it down there. So have you made inroads in Saudi Arabia, which said tends to be the source of a lot of fuel? Yeah, so they they produce a lot of fuel. They don't use nearly as much fuel as as, as other places. Right. So even though they're they're the producer, they're not the the end user so much. So uh, we we have we we've done we've done some testing with them. Um, they're they're a little more, you know, kind of old fashioned of thinking. They don't really want to change much. They don't want to spend extra money where they don't have to. We found uh, with the right. Aramco, um, you know, they 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 do. I mean, they they have, they got some interesting tech that they're that they're working on. We've had a chance to see um, in terms of what they're what they're trying to do to to help with uh, with air pollution. So it's not that they're doing nothing, but I think that this is one area where they they kind of are like, you know, we're we're not looking this way. So I don't know if we'll, you know, we'll. we'll We'll keep calling and checking back in now and again, but I I, I don't know if if, uh, if we'll be working probably in there too much. All right, all right. Well, this yeah. has been quite a, a life change for you, um, yeah. being Mister Entertainment guy and taking on a serious business and 
Um, and, uh, hey, entertainment's a serious business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you have crack, crack and jokes is very serious stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people kind of minimize the seriousness of, of entertainment business. Uh, I think, th yeah. So, yeah. Th now, you know, it's funny. It's, it's a surprising amount. Of, it's a surprising amount of work. It, it really is, particularly when you're when, you know, when you get started, you're in the low budget part of the business, right? It's not until you've right. done a few things that you start to get some money to work with. And uh, it's pretty incredible how much how efficient you have to get, right? And how how much sales work is involved, right? Because you have to convince people who have the ability to work with all the different equipment that you need, right? There's so much people that just you point a camera at a person and good luck, but no, you've got to you got to light it. You got to get the sound right. You've got to get the set right. You've got to get the costumes right. You've got to get the makeup right. You've got to get the actors who can do the job. You've got to have these thousand different little pieces of the puzzle and and put them all together. And when you're on a low budget situation, you have to do it a lot of times with basically a, you have to sell people on the promise of the project and that if it goes well, that that there's something for them in the future. There's there's that this is going to give them some money out of it eventually, or that they're going to get opportunities from it. And and that's. Believe it or not, it's 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 a lot of work to get a good team together to yeah. pull that off. Uh, I, would, yeah. I would imagine. Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati Podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies and so much more thank you in advance i would imagine i is is there i've often wondered this is there some sort of a formula that if you're marketing a product and you tell so many jokes per uh 30 second commercial that the sales improve 20 percent, 30 percent, or something like that is there some form there there are formulas well there are formulas but most of them have thrown out the window now because the world has changed so much <laughs> Back where, back when you'd see sitcoms, right? When you see Friends or Seinfeld or whatever else, I mean, there was there was definitely, I mean, the formula almost for for those comedies was you have to you have to get as many jokes as possible per minute. Like you you want you want every single moment to have some, either it is either it is the joke or it's leading to a bigger better joke, and it's just you have to kind of hit people with so many because people don't find the same thing funny. So if you want to have a, a hit show like that, you've got to have a bunch of different kind of diverse comedic comic topics that are all hit in a very short period of time so that people will laugh at something as it's going through or they don't get it. And then story-wise, you know, also it's it's, it's got to be, you've got to engage people. You've got to leave people on a cliffhanger. You've got to get them wanting to to find out what happens next and be like, what, what, then what, then what? And that's, that's, you know, th there are formulas to it, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, a lot of it, I mean, it's art, right? That's in the end, that's what it is. Like it's, it's art. Yeah. You, you have to sort of feel your way through it and, and, uh, and tell the story the right way with the right, you know, the right voice, uh, or, or it won't work no matter what formula you apply to it. Yeah. It would seem that, uh, when you took over as CEO, you probably looked at your existing marketing pieces that you had and you, you looked at one said boring, you looked at the next one boring <laughs> and you threw them all in the trash and started over is, is that kind of how you started? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, uh, yeah, we, we had a little lot, to, a lot to do in that regard, just, you know, and it's not, not, uh, for, through no fault of, of, uh, of, you know, the, the, the folks who came before me, but like I said, I, I, I'm, I had a different mind, right. I think they're very technical. So a lot of the, the, the presentation materials, a lot of what was on, you know, the, the promotional materials and the website and everywhere else was very, it was very tech technical it was it was really so that a scientist or an engineer could look at it and, and and appreciate it and understand it and want to move forward with it and i think that that works i mean if you're if you're going towards that audience that definitely works um part of of me coming along and, and doing this was to sort of shift the company from being a technical to a bit more emotional uh and to, okay. to, to tap into to, to what people kind of want emo emotionally and to try to help you know, widen the, 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 the audience and then the camp for people who want to do something to help the planet and who would want to look at something like Green Plus and our future technologies as an option. 
as well as just to get more people in, in, into the idea that, you know, that, that there's, there is a problem. I think that the severity of the problem, you know, you could argue about like how, how, how quickly uh, we're, we would, we would all die in this hellfire of, of, <laughs> of the storm or whatever, um, or, or if that's going to, you know, happen at all, you know, I don't know, but we're, we're certainly, we're certainly doing things that aren't good for the planet in a lot of ways. Uh, and I know in, a, in America, we've done a lot to, to improve that. I think that, that here uh, and in Europe, but really here, uh, we've done more than anybody to, to try to curtail that, to try to do a better job uh, about, about how we pollute uh, and everything else. But at the same time, we've got to take a little responsibility for the fact that we've shipped a lot of our emissions over to China, right? Like the, the, everything we produce is produced somewhere else. All the all the carbon emissions that we then use here with all of our phones and all of our toys and our gadgets and our cars and all the rest of it, that's all produced somewhere else. So we don't count those emissions anymore. Instead, they're somewhere else where they don't have the regulation, where they don't have the rules, where they don't necessarily care about what's going on. So it's, you know, it's like if the, if the, if the problem isn't in my backyard, it's not a problem. It's kind of, I think the attitude for a lot of people, which, which is, you know, which is fair enough because you can't see it, but I think that there's a balance, right? Like we got to look at, okay, so how bad is the problem and does something need to be done? And I, I think it's pretty clear that something does need to be done. I also don't think that freaking people out is as effective as maybe the, the, the general environmentalist thinks that it is. I, I don't, I don't think that it's such a good way to, to get us to move along to have an IPCC report that's frankly an exaggeration and that that's that's inaccurate. Oh, sorry for the audience. That's the that's the United Nations uh, report that they make on, on climate change and, and how soon we're going to die. Um, you know, I, I I think it's you know their 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 more their their average report like their their likely scenario is actually not that ridiculous. It's they're in most cases when you say their their likely scenario, it's something that we can survive with technology quite. Not easily, but if we just keep at it, right? right. But people very much at press will point to worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? And yeah, the worst thing that could possibly happen would be horrible. Right. Okay. That's so not where we're headed. That's I'm looking. Go ahead. As, Sorry. As a person who does a lot of driving, um, over the past uh, dozen, 10 years, I've been getting more and more anxious about autonomous transportation. I can't wait for to just jump into a car and have it take me to Chicago or take me to Atlanta or Miami or someplace, and and I, I just fall asleep in the back seat or maybe play video games, watch movies, and I'm next morning I'm there. Um, <laughs> and that seems magical, and I would love for that to happen. How does the autonomous transportation world um, is that affected by? Uh, your products and in kind of your way of thinking are is um, does that change uh, change the kind of the way pollution works in the world? Uh, have you have you stepped your thinking through that? Yeah, well, look if if you can get it right, it would definitely help with pollution, and it would definitely it would help with everything. If you got it right, it would be it would be magical for it because. You wouldn't have people who are emotionally driving because they relate to their place. It's like the car is going to get there when the car gets there because the car is on an automatic run, right? So right. That, that's, that's one thing, right? So people don't drive very effectively if you're trying to save the planet. They drive to their needs. If you are five minutes late to a meeting, you're going to do everything you can to to accelerate up to the light. Right. You know, new brakes, wait for it to go, accelerate and fly, right? And that's that's just not very, that, that driving is not conducive to a good environment. But having an autonomous, you know, AI driving the car uh, and driving it based on a formula, uh, and having that be, you know, having having clean, clean, good, clear, good driving as part of that would absolutely help the planet. Also, if you had autonomous cars that were driving around, people wouldn't have cars anymore. Like people wouldn't have their own car anymore. And if people don't have their own car anymore, they're just taking things up from the fleet that's going around the automatic, the automated Uber, if you will. Uh, those cars would all be parked and then they would go out and do their job and then go be parked. We would need less of them. They, we would need less of them and then they would all just do their job and, and keep working away. So that would also be good for the environment. So there's a flip side to it and that is that it's been kind of promised to us for, I mean, I think, I think um, at Tesla, Elon Musk has been very bullish that it's going to be, we're going to get it any day now since <laughs> 2003. Right. 
Right. Right. And then it's going to come out. And I, I think that it's, it's like, you, you would probably know about this. I mean, I know you, you guys talk a lot about uh, AI and, and the future right. of that on your show, but it, it seems to me that we can get the technology 95% of the way there really fast. Like we can get it to, to that point in a hurry. And right. that, that's really amazing and really impressive. And people look at it and go, oh my God, this is great. Yeah. But I think that last 5% that you can't necessarily get very easily is the important yeah. 5%, right? It's, that, right. It's, that, it's the little things that you can't really adjust for. And I think that's what keeps autonomous driving from making it there. I think that those little right. tiny details that are in everything might take longer than we think. Yeah, it ends up being a, a far harder problem to solve than most people um, thought initially, and uh, yeah. and th those edge cases keep cropping up again and again and again. That uh, damn it, it just doesn't work right. We got to go back to the drawing board. Let's try it again. <laughs> yeah, and, and the problem is, it's a vehicle, right? If you get it wrong, that's life or death. You know. Yeah. But once yeah. once they get it right. Um, I've actually been in the country of India, and I, I I don't understand how they can ever switch to autonomous transportation in India. But that's a whole other right. topic. There. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never been. My brother has. If I've heard, I've heard tell of the uh, of, of the way they drive, the way it goes, and it does seem yeah yeah um, complicated. But uh, it's got to get someplace. But it just seems like that becomes kind of this magical thing once we we get to that moment where we can just get into a car. And it takes us to where we want to go. Yeah. Uh, my last trip to South Korea, I got into a driverless car there. Um, they put a speed limit, I think, of like 15 miles an hour or something like that on it. Um, yeah. So it wasn't terribly practical to go anywhere. Um, and right. it, it just had it on a, a set course. And so the likelihood of running into somebody or something was pretty pretty remote um right but uh, then again it wasn't practical so they were they were erring on the side of caution on the side of uh safety and they want to make sure that everybody came out okay um some somehow it has to be much faster be much more um i don't know uh I, I, you know I, I i put together these scenarios um yeah. one of them is is uh, will it ever be okay to just put our, our kid into a driverless car by themselves? Uh, if, if you had a car that recognized a parent on one end and a teacher on the other end, could you put a six-year-old kid into a car to drive to school by themselves? And, um, and for how long? Uh, is 10 minutes okay? Is 30 minutes too long? Um, and so we haven't really worked through any of the policy stuff on, on that. And there's, there's a whole lot of those issues that are going to keep coming up in the future. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think, I think parenting in general has changed so much that I, I doubt it would happen just because of the parents. Forget about, forget about the regulations. But, you know, I mean, I, I know that <laughs> when I was growing up, it was like, go, go play. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna hear us. You're gonna hear a scream somewhere around dinner time, and then you better make it back, or it's gonna be your hide, right? Yeah. Um, and now, I, you know, with with my kids, like, wow, we just, we would never do that. They just right. wouldn't work, and I think we'd get in trouble if we did. Uh, honestly, by by other parents or somebody, like it just doesn't doesn't quite work. It's not the same yeah. world. Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers, able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. Yeah, uh, you, you kind of want to be a helicopter parent, but uh, with actually a flying drone over their head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, it's funny. The instinct is, is uh, that's so strong that it's, you almost have to force yourself to to do the opposite. I, mean, I have a daughter who, who turned 16, uh, you know, well, it's about half a year ago now, but she turned 16 and she, you know, she, want, she wanted to drive. She wanted to get a license. So we were on top of that and she got her license pretty close to her 16th birthday. And, you know, when she has her license, she wants, she now wants freedom. She wants to drive. She wants to go. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how difficult that is to, to just, 
Right. You have to step back and, and be like, okay, well, they if they don't start taking responsibility for themselves, they'll never take responsibility for themselves and they'll never be an adult. So oh, exactly. Funny. And we're seeing a lot of those problems right now. Sure. Uh, well, this is uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, tell me, tell me what you hope to do in the near future as moving forward. And then, uh, how do you hope to position your, your company so that you make the maximum impact, uh, before you leave and, uh, and start the, the next wildfire with uh, your ambitions. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, well, BioFriendly Planet, I think, is going to be a big one. I think it's a, I think it's needed in the space, uh, and we are investing quite a bit into that to grow it, uh, to, to make it into a, sort of a leader in, in, in the environment. And the goal there, if we get that right, will be that it's a, a great big, warm, welcoming tent that anybody who maybe hasn't considered that that there's anything they need to do to help the planet in any way, forgetting you know, climate change or the rest of it, but just dealing with pollution or, or you know, how how often they recycle or whatever else, right? right. Um, to just make a, a a a larger tent for more people who are willing to jump in and and uh, and do little things, little things every day that'll help. Uh, that's something we're focusing a lot on, and as part of that, you know, we'll be seeing some some fun uh, content there, some fun shows, some some pretty ridiculous, silly things that, that we've, you know, would be right in line with the kind of stuff that I've liked to produce in the past. I've got some of that. So my old crew, they're, they're joining the team at uh, BioFriendly to help do it. So it should be, should be a lot of fun in the next, uh, next couple of years. Uh, and then in terms of, of, uh, the planet, I mean, we're, we're, we're going pretty whole hog on, on, on new tech because to me, I think regardless of, of what you think about the, the future and the environment, I've been, the solution isn't going to just be uh, people changing their habits and and people, you know, consuming less and and doing more. It's it's also going to require better new technology for us to handle things, you know, things like like just crazier storms and bigger changes in the weather and all the other kind of massive wild weird things that are happening and will continue to happen more frequently. Like we've got to have we've got to have solutions for those. And the best tool we have is you know the the one between our ears, right. so right. that's that's where we're that's where we're going to make the biggest impact, I believe, in the in the future. Well, that's remarkable. Yeah, I've often said that um, we 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 can't just solve solve all of the past problems. Somehow, we need to advance civilization at the same time. Yep. And so that's where um, that's where I think that we got to somehow achieve the right balance. Yeah. Uh, too much of our time is focused on the past problems. Well, I I uh, applaud your effort. I think that uh, this is something that I hope lots of people are going to find out about and pay attention to. And I, I wish you the best in uh, making uh, Biofriendly Planet something that everybody's going to pay attention to. Oh, well, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, and how do, how do people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch? Uh, yeah, so you can you can visit biofriendlyplanet.com is uh, is is the the first place to look, uh, or you can find us uh, on our socials. So like on on uh, Twitter and Instagram, just biofriendly, b one word b i o f r i e n d l y, uh, or on uh, or or biofriendly uh, planet is the is the other place you can look for us. So those are our socials. Okay, well, very good. Well, we will uh, wish you the best moving forward. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.